Ja. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. To the Honorable Professor Dr. Retno Saraswati, SHM Hum, the Dean of Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. To the Honorable Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro, Dr. Tri Laksmi Indriyaswari, SHM Hum. To the Honorable Speaker, Professor Dr. Hassani Muhammad Ali from Faculty of Law, the National University of Malaysia. The respectable moderator, Mr. Rahandi Rizky Prananda, SHMH. And a very warm welcome to the participants and students of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. It is indeed a pleasure to have all of you in this memorable occasion. And I would like to thank God for his blessings so that this morning we could gather here in this visiting lecture regarding of bankruptcy during the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we begin, allow me to read our agendas for this morning. First, there will be an opening speech by the Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. Second, the lecture will be open and guided by our moderator. Third, we will together listen to the general lecture session, followed by question and answer session that will be guided by our moderator. And finally, at the end of the session, there will be a photo session with all participants and also the closing session for today's visiting lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to listen to the welcoming speech delivered by the Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro, Dr. Tri Laksmi Indriyaswari, SHM Hu. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. The Honorable Professor Dr. Retno Saraswati, SHM Hu, the Dean of Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro, the Honorable Professor Dr. Hassani Muhammad Ali, from Faculty of Law, the National University of Malaysia, Lecture students and all participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning to all of you. Alhamdulillah, thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing. So we can join here today in the visiting lecture in a good condition. On behalf of Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro, I am privileged and deeply honored to welcome Professor Dr. Hassani Muhammad Ali and all participants of this visiting lecture on bankruptcy during the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic COVID-19 affects in many aspects of our lives, our lives, public health, social life, education, and of course, the economy. The effect of the pandemic has been devastating for the companies, stores, restaurants, banks, and many more. We can see how the pandemic also increased the bankruptcy case in around the world. There were, therefore, in this greetingful occasion, the visiting lecture intend to develop our students' knowledge about the latest issue, bankruptcy during pandemic COVID-19. We do hope the collaboration, networking, academic activities between Faculty of Law and the National University of Malaysia and Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro will continue in the future. To all participants, have a fruitful visiting lecture. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Trilaksmi Indraswari SHM Hong for delivering the speech. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to our main agenda, the general lecture. But before that, allow me to introduce our moderator, Mr. Rahandi Rizky Prananda SHMH. Mr. Rahandi Rizky Prananda is one of the lecturers in Civil Law Department, Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. He obtained his bachelor and master degree in Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. He has taught all subjects in subchapter private law and his research interest area in the area of civil law, business law, and digital economic law. He is assigned as staff on Media and Public Relations Task Force in Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. Without further ado, please welcome Mr. Rahandi Rizky Prananda. Okay, thank you, uh, Maharani, for your introduction. Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you are in good condition and nice health uh, during these circumstances. 
Uh, first of all, uh, before I hand over the screen of platform against Professor Hassani, let me introduce myself in brief. My name is Rahandi Rizky Prananda. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Civil Law, Faculty of Law, Diponegoro University. Honestly, uh, today uh, it is an honor and privilege for us to have a very notable speaker, uh, Professor Hassani, who has expertise in securities law, uh, insolvency law, and corporate law. Uh, Professor Hassani, uh, thank you for your acceptance uh, towards our invitation. Uh, it is very beneficial for us in upgrading our student knowledge uh, in this topic. Uh, well, uh, talking about uh, bankruptcy in pandemic era, we know that uh, nowadays is very crucial issue. Many business entity uh, face in repaying loans to creditor, which lead to a shoe in the courts. Uh, to resolve uh, these matters, uh, the one of way taken by creditor is propose a payment of debts against debtor by using bankruptcy law suite in a court. Uh, can we imagine that COVID-19 outbreak that has not clearly ended, but it bring a huge impact on the number of bankruptcy and suspension, suspension of payment cases in the court. Uh, this condition is quite worrying because it proved that many companies facing difficulty in fulfilling their payment obligation against creditor. Uh, it is need uh, some innovative policy from the government to resolve this problem. That's why we need Prof. Hassani Muhammad Ali here to share his expertise to elaborate this sexy issue. However, before our notable speaker start his presentation, uh, let me read uh, his curriculum vitae uh, by share screen. Uh, professor Dr. Hassani Muhammad Ali, LLB, LLM, is a professor in Faculty of Law, the National University of Malaysia. Next. He completed his LLB degree from International Islamic University Malaysia in 1994, and he continued his LLM degree from Sheffield University, United Kingdom in 1996. He continued his study uh, for a PhD title and obtained uh, this title in 2005 from Dundee University, United Kingdom. Uh, he is also uh, experienced uh, holding some several administrative position in Faculty of Law the National University of Malaysia, such as Deputy Dean for Graduate Research International and Industrial Relation from 2011 until 2014, and then the Deputy Dean for Networking and Income Generation from 2018 until 2019. His research area, including company law, corporate governance, security regulation, corporate insolvency, and several issue related commercial law. Next. Okay. Uh, Professor Hassani uh, also actively involved and in conducting research, conducting research by publishing in renowned publisher and index international journal. Uh, he also is also uh, invited as external examiner and giving public lecture at various universities in Malaysia, Indonesia, People Republic of China, and Japan. Now, 
without due and interruption, more and less 45 minutes, I'm giving the screen and platform to our honorable speaker for Professor Hassani. The time is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rahandi. I would like to share my screen first. Um, right. I guess this is it. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rahandi, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Undip. Uh, uh, Universitas of uh, Diponegoro for inviting me. Uh, the Honorable uh, Dean, Vice Dean, all the Honorable guests and uh, all the participants of this lectures or seminar. Uh, I'm honored to be invited and uh, I, I actually determined the topics regarding bankruptcy during the COVID-19 pandemic with special reference to Malaysia. Uh, this is based on what I personally think probably have some many common commonality or similarities with the situation in Indonesia. Uh, just happened that I also I'm now writing an article relating to the COVID-19 and the bankruptcy with a friend from Surabaya. So I got some input and insight from what happened in Indonesia as well, which are not that particularly different from what happened in Malaysia. But what I'm going to discuss here is very much therefore, unfortunately, uh, inclined to be from my perspective as a mission, <laughs> but hopefully uh, uh, it also can be uh, compared with the Indonesian situation, which I think uh, since there are many similarities, probably quite different in one or two strategies adopted, but uh, the theory are almost probably uh, resemblance to each other. Okay, so this is it. Uh, we are now in the pandemic situation. Uh, from my conversation with the Vice Dean, Ibu Tri Laksmi, uh, we have been here, we have been in, the, in this uh, pandemic maybe for two years already. Since then, this is the things that we are indoctrinated, a new normal what they call it and also from now and then there has been lockdown we are we are almost restricted we cannot really move from one place to another freely and because of that it brings about a severe economic impacts especially to the small to the to the small uh, businesses, entrepreneurs, not to mention also the even the multinational companies and all the big giant corporations. They are all probably also severely hit by the crisis. And what I'm going to discuss this morning and like to share with you is the way of how our insolvency law cope with the situation. If we allow more companies to close down their business, if we allow more individuals to become bankrupt, it may mean that much of the economic activity will be stagnant. And in fact, that what happened. The economic activity mostly are already uh, impacted hardly because of the pandemic because when we cannot we cannot move we cannot get out from our home it means that many of the activities cannot be carried out so what i'm going to discuss according to the outline that i'm i will 
to use today is first I would like to discuss about movement control order and its economic impacts. And the most important thing after that is I would like to extract the existing laws. And from what we will see, we will see later the fact is uh, in either insolvency or bankruptcy, which I will explain later, they are not actually uh, something we would like to have at this moment, especially when the uh, causes or the, the main reason why they become bankrupt is not because of their reason. It's not because of their fault. So we are going to see whether or not the inclination towards bankruptcy or insolvency then and now should be treated differently or should we actually treat them in a way that this is only a temporary measure. And I will discuss the response and recovery plans. That's what we have in Malaysia. Probably I just mentioned what happened in Indonesia from what the sources that I have may be limited. <laughs> and then the current conditions, are we actually in the end of the tunnel already? Can we see some light in the end? I believe we are, there are much optimism and now we are about to end our, you know, uh, but we are not, uh, as we always uh, claim, we we don't win yet. Eh? Uh, so we have to continue fighting. And the way forward is how are we going to live with this COVID-19? Okay, so this is the movement control order in Malaysia. It's sometime, you know, the thing is there are so many jargon here. And so I, as an ordinary layman, I just don't want to really stress on what type of movement control order that in place now, because there are one after another. So we have strict one and less strict one. That is just the, the difference between the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the scheme or the order that has been imposed eh, to us. Eh? Sometimes very, very much uh, restricted. We cannot do almost anything that is an enhanced uh, control order. Uh, it can be, uh, it can be uh, imposed based on certain condition, but for much of the situation, probably they are not. So until now, this is just only up until June, but now we are the government, our government has introduced a kind of order which are based on the plan. So uh, on the phase, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. And so every state in Malaysia, they have different type of uh, level of uh, control order imposed. And in the Sango where Actually, where I am now, we are into phase two to phase three. So the restriction has been become more and more relaxed. So, but uh, we still we still have to commit to our lockdown and uh, you know all the restriction, including social distancing and facing masks. Right? whenever we are going out. So that is, therefore, I think sometimes I just do not know how to differentiate between these differences in uh, imposing movement control order. But one more thing, since very recently, we try to allow some kind of activities which we never did before, or we never allow, uh, for example, in relation to uh, uh, tourism. So, for example, Langkawi is already open up uh, only for local uh, tourists, but with very uh, uh, severe restriction. So, they are cannot, therefore, we cannot really 
uh, grow freely as what we wish uh, unless we meet those conditions. Eh? And still in the, in, in the public places, we have still uh, to follow the SOP, eh? Standard Operating Procedure, facing masks and social distancing. Eh? So that's uh, therefore the norm, the new normal that we are now subscribing. <laughs> so uh, this is our movement control order. And this is the economic impact. So what we could see a number, I will show you maybe the, at the end of the, uh, my lecture today, how the economic impact actually has brought about many insolvency or bankruptcy cases in Malaysia. So why it's so? Because of the, first and foremost, it is about health issues. It is about nothing more than uh, it could be endangered our life, but soon it become an economic crisis when people cannot live the way that they should. Soon it become a problem to many of the economic activities, and these are the least, more and less, entertainment and recreations, which requires crowd or gathering of people, market and bazaars, unless you are doing it online. Many business knows how just to be creative, go online, and actually some of the business actually got a huge fortune because of the pandemic. But that's only a privileged view, many of which are still suffering. They are suffering because of the the, the fact that they cannot run business the way they should, or to the extent that this, uh, into the scale that they may enjoy profitability. And at the same time, <clears throat> there are so many of these panic buying and essential item shortage. Sometimes, uh, you know, what we could see in this year, for example, the price of the commodity or the price of the basic needs can easily move up because of the, you know, the movement between states are not relaxed. So somehow it affects uh, the way of how they distribute foods and so on. And not to mention restaurants and eateries, they are almost, you know, uh, non-active. Uh, uh, non uh, only very recently, some of the restaurants and eateries are open open up for dine-in, but unfortunately, many of the population actually are very skeptical. So they cannot really enjoy the number of uh, customers uh, getting into their restaurants, uh, dine-in. Okay, so, and also not to mention tourism. So the tourism industries uh, are heavily affected because of this pandemic, not to mention, and also some other activities here. Yeah? So what we could see here, uh, the economic impact of the COVID-19 has brought about a situation where which business may be affected. And at the same time, at the same time, it may also cause mass, mass, mass layoff, no? the retrenchment of workers the employees uh, may lose their job simply because their business where they are serving cannot run at their full scale. So just imagine if a pilot, for example, cannot fly, it means that they have, he has no income and, and, and probably what he can do is to find some temporary measures to relieve himself or themselves from the situations. So that is actually the economic impact of the COVID-19 severely impacted and most of the, there are many numbers of those who are living in the bracket of M40. M40 is the middle income uh, in the middle between below 40 and top 20 uh, income earners. Uh, those in our M40 may suffer 
and they become B40 and some of the T20 may also suffer and they can become M20, uh, sorry, uh, uh, B40. So that is the classification of income bracket based on uh, earning. So that is what happened in Malaysia. So there's no surprise then uh, in this situation, we cannot just depend on the law. There is must uh, uh, an intervention, a positive intervention on the part of the government of the day to put the situation right. This is the situation where we need to make sure that the, econo the economic is not going to be uh, fully impacted by the, by the pandemic. Uh, but as you know, in Malaysia, we are experiencing some political problems. Um, and hopefully they managed to uh, they managed to get out from their uh, polemics between parties and between politicians. So the, the most important things that we are going to concentrate now is to get out from the pandemic uh, impact of the to the economy and also to the social well-being because at the same time also this is the thing that I I must stress the pandemic has also not brought about economic uh, economic impacts to the population but most of the situation because of the health issue because of the economic issue it can also bring about psychological issues. Many are suffering distress. Many are try to commit suicide. There are already a staggering number of suicidal cases among the population, which is should, shouldn't be welcome. Uh, and most of them probably, especially among the young uh, teenagers, they are you know, become a teenager means they would like to have a social life, but unfortunately, they cannot have it at the at the moment. So they are suffering much because of that. So that that those are among the the impacts of the COVID nineteen. That in the end we can see, uh, we need to therefore address the issues from a more uh, pragmatic and more uh, and to be to be uh, to be really careful in uh, managing the situations. Okay, well, uh, now we are going to the insolvency law. First of all, we are going to I, I'm going to discuss about what is insolvency. So because. Uh, I think this has to be made very clear from the beginning. This is a concept that we are going to discuss throughout the issue relating to the insolvency and bankruptcy. So when we refer to the terminology, actually bankruptcy and insolvency, they, are, they carry almost similar meaning. There are no differences. Eh? But in terms of the use, for example, in Malaysia, we don't use bankruptcy for companies. Bankruptcy are only for the individuals. We normally use winding up. So the winding up or liquidation of the company, it means that the company is towards the end of its life. And the bankruptcy is just a situation where an individual has been held a bankrupt because he cannot pay his debt. So that is the difference between the terminology and bankruptcy. But in US, for example, bankruptcy refers to almost the same, just like insolvency. The insolvency is in fact a concept which justifies both winding up and bankruptcy among the individual. So when we are talking about insolvency, it means that for example, when we refer to a company, a company can pay, cannot pay 
its debts when it falls due. When a company cannot pay its debt when it falls due, it falls due means if you have, uh, for example, uh, uh, for a period of time to rectify your situation, if you cannot pay in time, it means that you may be given some kind of delay. Uh, you are allowed to delay your uh, your payment, maybe up to two months. But after that, maybe you become commercially insolvent. So that is insolvency. It means that, uh, I will touch about this later, it can be determined either through uh, commercial tests or even uh, uh, the tests based on the uh, asset and liabilities. So those that is the concept. The insolvency justify the action taken against the individual or the company, and in order to make them bank uh, bankrupt or own up uh, liquidation. So those are the concept uh, relating to the insolvency. So for the purpose of my lecture this morning, I would like to touch on the personal bankruptcy as well as the winding up as a whole, I would like to refer to the fact that they are, they are uh, actually some rehabilitation or rehabilitative strategies that we allow because nowadays the tendency is to uh, shifting towards recognizing more allowance and more rooms for them to uh, to pick a rescue regime, they shouldn't be made bankrupt. Or sh they should be allowed to address, uh, to rectify themselves before they become bankrupt or uh, the company become uh, uh, subject to a winding up proceeding. Okay, so that is a little bit about insolvency law and its concept. And now I would like to move to the objectives. So when we refer to the textbooks, there are so many objectives of the insolvency law. So I would like to just highlight among the most important or most salient objective among the uh, insolvency regime throughout the, throughout the world, in fact. First and foremost is to provide an insolvency forum. So what is insolvency forum? It is the forum where you can determine uh, that a particular business cannot be, uh, need to be closed down. And we need to have all those you know, creditors and all the other claimants yeah, to sit down and to determine what are their claims. And so to provide insolvency forum means there, there must be a kind of administration. Normally in Malaysia, what we call it is a liquidator. So a liquidator will in charge and the liquidator will actually determine uh, how the uh, all the process will be uh, conducted. And what is the purpose to preserve the asset and determine the ranking of the claims? So by providing an, a forum, Insolvency forum will make sure that all the assets will be preserved because once once it is triggered, once the forum is triggered, it means that all the assets will be preserved. No more transfer allowed between the assets subject to a winding up forum and also uh, the the fact that uh, it will be uh, removed huh, by a, probably a shareholder. So if it happens, it means that it becomes a, a, crime, a crime. So those who may be doing these things can be charged under the criminal offense. So that is the to preserve the assets for the benefit of those claimants. So in order to make sure that the claimants will be fairly treated. So this is the forum which determine the ranking. So the ranking is based on the secured creditors, first come first serve, whether or not their claims are of rights or just merely 
a right in equity, the, the right which is not really, uh, cannot be proven or there's no formality in terms of the uh, paperwork or everything. So, so there's, uh, if let's say they are not full, registered well or something like that. So it means that it may affect their, their interests. These are the main objective of the insolvency law. But nowadays, we are moving towards the need to have a rehabilitative measures. So to promote rehabilitation is one of the most important objective of the insolvency law. Why? Because most of the time, insolvency become a punishment. The bankruptcy it follows or the winding up proceeding is become a punishment which is unfairly imposed, especially to those stakeholders. What I mean is this is not just because of the shareholders or the manager which are culprit managers. They are the one who commit such a uh, who become the cause why the insolvency is triggered. But that is not all about the business. The, the business may have a right to survive and to be rehabilitated because of there are some broader interests of other stakeholders, especially among creditors, especially among those who are legitimately, just like employees, they legitimately uh, depend on the companies for their living. So it's it is unfair just to let the companies close down and without actually taking into account their interests. So, so the rehabilitation uh, is therefore need to be promoted. Uh, so especially nowadays, we are talking about the economy which becomes stagnant, not because of our fault. And because of that, we cannot pay our debts. So it's unfair for us to to be, uh, to be held bankrupt just because we cannot pay our debts. So that is unfair. At the same time, if there is any wrongdoers, they deserve, uh, they should be punished. They are culpable. They are blameworthy. So they should be therefore punishable. So for example, in certain companies, there are wrongdoings. They're, there may be like there might be cases of misapplication of property and so on. Yeah? So maybe that is the the forum where insolvency law may address to punish the wrongdoers, but at the same time to rehab, uh, rehabilitate the business that is still possible. So that is among the main objective of the insolvency law, and this is only the among the major one. What I would say. Okay, so let's go to the company's situation. There are two types of, uh, you know, when companies are facing insolvency, when the companies are on the verge of insolvency or technically they are uh, pretty much approaching the zone of insolvency. So these are the symptoms of company in distress, default payment, Failure of retention and minimum level of net worth. Default payment is quite common. If you cannot pay your debt on in time, it means that you are start experiencing some kind of economic uh, financial difficulties. So, if you see, uh, the the companies are now experiencing default payments or failure to return minimum level of net worth. It means that very much probably the director's duty during this time is to take into account creditors' interests in our common law position. This is the time where actually the company may start thinking about closing down or seizing business properly in order to allow the asset not to be subject to dissipation or maybe the asset will become lost just because of the further trading which are unproductive or no, no longer profitable. Uh, I hope I, I, 
uh, I can I can put across my message. Uh, uh, if you got some problem with my uh, language or my explanation, please let me know. Uh, because sometimes I just uh, use the language probably not familiar to your system. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but okay, so. What are the inability to pay debts? So it can be determined according to tests. So these are two major tests normally applicable to the situation. And normally the simple and most straightforward test is about the cash flow test or insolvency test. When you cannot pay your debt within time, maybe you will be receiving a letter of demand and the letter of demand will justify an action of bankruptcy or winding up taken against the uh, debtor. So, but the balance sheet test is only normally refers to the company. And this is the type of companies, balance sheet, you know, there's uh, asset and liability. Each of the company may have assets and liability and it must be balanced. If possible, most of the time, the asset will far more than the liability. And if that is so, the company is actually enjoying profitability. But if the company is suffering losses and as a result, asset less than the liability, it means that the company become more, uh, is suffering the inability to pay debts in no time. And very soon, the company may experience kind of situation where they cannot pay the, the debt yeah? and this is the situation probably before before it happened it may justify a claimant a creditor to uh, file a winding up proceeding against the company so this is the test developed for the to determine inability to pay debts either in the bankruptcy or in a winding up proceeding uh, proceeding uh, for companies and individuals alike. So stages in bankruptcy. This is for only individual or personal. Personal means you as an employee or you as a person, ordinary person. Now in Malaysia, actually the Malaysia is following what is already the development in the other common law based countries like Australia and UK or especially. Uh, we have this pre-bankruptcy procedure. So <clears throat> uh, I just like to you know share some of the views that I got from some of the seminar I attended relating to the motivation cost and so on. Uh, actually, for American folks, uh, especially, they are not afraid to become bankrupt. Uh, to them, bankruptcy is just one of the stages before they can become successful. So pre-bankruptcy procedure, therefore, is in order to make sure that those become bankrupt, will be given a chance. Before they become bankrupt, they will be given be given a chance to restructure their position, to reconsolidate himself in order to get out from the bankruptcy situation. So that is a pre-bankruptcy procedure that was just introduced in Malaysia somewhere in 2017. This is a new procedure, but last time. When a creditor has problem with the payment of the uh, a debtor, they start filing for bankruptcy. So how to file a bankruptcy? This is it. It begins with the notice. Notice means just to give you, just to let the debtor, the debtor know. The debtor. Uh, sometimes I use I. I use the word debtor without B. Uh, you know, sometimes you got problem with some of the students, but that is the way of how to pronounce it, debtor. So 
the debtor may uh, experience some, uh, you, you know, they, they cannot pay the debt according to the schedule. So he will receive a notice. Notice uh, at the same time reminding him if actions uh, or payment is not made, action may be taken against him. Maybe he is given a period of time, maybe 14 days, 21 days, as the case may be. And then the bankruptcy petition will be made for, to bankrupt him. And uh, if, let's say, the bankruptcy petition is successful, now he become bankrupt. So this is the, you know, just like a punishment. Uh, in the more advanced jurisdiction, they would call bankruptcy is a protection. Meaning that we cannot do anything more to the bankruptcy. So that is a protection to them. But in this kind of, you know, the flow of the event, it seems that it is a bankrupt because once you become a bankrupt, you cannot deal in business anymore. You cannot buy, you cannot uh, possess property, you cannot own property, you cannot enter into transactions and so on. You the, the bankrupt person become uh, incapacitated, losing his capacity to enter into a contract. So that's what happened normally when bankruptcy procedure is uh, taken against uh, an individual. So that's why we would say the bankruptcy petition is normally served as a uh, uh, punishment. And in fact, <clears throat> long, long time ago, the history from a, a historical perspective, those bankrupt must be jailed. So that is even worse. Those bankrupt must be jailed because he cannot fulfill his duty or his obligation to pay his debt. That is what happened in maybe 100, 300 years ago. So, after the bankruptcy petition and a person can become bankrupt, he may be discharged from his bankruptcy. So uh, I think in, Malaysia, in Indonesia, we call it bankrut, kebangkrutan. So in Indonesia, we call it bankruptcy. So, <clears throat> okay, that is for personal, for personal law. And this is since 2017. The situation since 2017. Yeah, the, the situation since 2017, yes, there is a you know a reform introduced uh, in order to make sure that this uh, bankruptcy will be. Uh, relax or at least can be uh, can be controlled not not to be uh, applicable to many individuals just like when they serve as a social guarantors social guarantors means someone who like to do the if let's say someone would like to further his study and he would like to make a loan and he need a guarantor so a guarantor will because when he made a loan, he has no earn. He cannot earn. But uh, he is protected. Uh, the, the social guarantors who give him a guarantee, if let's say the payment cannot be made in time, this kind of social guarantors who just like to help others, he should be protected against bankruptcy proceedings. And that is just introduced in 2017 and then introduction to the voluntary arrangement for a bankrupt pre-bankruptcy proceedings a pre-bankruptcy proceedings uh, one moment
uh, pada ini Profesor Hasani, uh, maybe you can uh, unmute your speaker and open your camera. Halo, Profesor Hasani. Halo. Am I audible, Profesor Hasani? Uh, really sorry, really sorry, Mr. Randy. I just got a situation. <laughs> That's that is the you know the downside when we are working from home. <laughs> Sometimes, you know. Uh, okay, I just got a situation just now. Sorry, really sorry. All right, okay. So that is a social guarantor. Social guarantors are protected, therefore. And another thing is we have this uh, pre-bankruptcy procedure, meaning that there is must be some kind of rehabilitation procedure. So the measures must be taken against them to consolidate and to restructure his loan. And then uh, this is another thing uh, for those who are like to be discharged, they, they are more, now more relaxed procedure in place in order to allow them to, to be discharged uh, from a bankruptcy. But this is the most important thing that I would think I'd like to share with you. Uh, the minimum threshold, meaning that how much the debt in order to allow uh, the creditor to take action against the debtor. Uh, the action, the, 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 the minimum is, uh, has been from, this is the number, you know, it, it keep on staggeringly increase and now, the latest one is 100K, 100,000 ringgit in order to make a, someone bankrupt. And as a result, you can see, you can see the, the number of bankruptcy is actually getting lowered, yeah? but not because of, there are not many of them who afford to pay, just because they don't reach the threshold. This is the minimum requirement before they can be allowed to, uh, to be, uh, subject to the proceedings. So this is uh, insolvency from uh, uh, personal point of view. So, so this is just I would like to highlight among them uh, the most important procedure that has been in place for for some time uh, since 2017. That to apply before a judge a bankrupt. So. As I mentioned earlier, a bankrupt, bankruptcy shouldn't be actually viewed as something which made someone uh, in from a social uh, perspective, he has been uh, a, a wrongdoer. <clears throat> in fact, that is uh, actually one of the batch before he become or level before he become more successful. So maybe he has to, you know, learn from the uh, situations. So this is the, the 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 way of how he may actually restructure his loan, and probably get out from the situation. Nomini is appointed. Nomini is someone with the qualification to, uh, in order to make him, uh, you know, to guide him how he may reconsolidate his position and application for interim order. So uh, application for interim order, order it means here is the order to uh, to have all this statement or his position as a bankrupt person, how much is your debt and how much you can pay or are willing to pay from where your income is still coming and so on. Eh? And summoning of the creditors and the approval. This is a plan actually. Uh, I will like stress here, this is a plan from which we can help the bankrupt to identify ways for possibly of how he can be, he can get out from the situation, bankruptcy situations. Okay, and this is another perspective 
uh, if you can see the corporate insolvency framework. No? So what I just discussed just now is about the insolvency, insolvency when it comes to individuals and now insolvency for corporations, for corporate uh, sector. There are many kinds of bankruptcy proceedings here. I would like just to stress here, there's a winding up proceeding when you cannot pay your debts when it falls you. So when company, a company cannot pay its debt when it falls you, it means that it may be subject to a winding up process. But at the same time, there is a receivership process and there's some other process here. As, as you can see, this is already obsolete. It's already obsolete since 1997. This is before the 2016. And only after 2016, we introduced three more, three more uh, measures to help the company to get out of the, of the situation. One is scheme of arrangement. I will go to this later, judicial management and co corporate voluntary arrangement. So they are, the, the, the terms are quite technical, but what I'm saying is all this uh, scheme, uh, they are there in order to help companies to restructure and to rescue the companies from uh, subject to a bankruptcy, or subject to a winding up proceeding. When we're talking about scheme of arrangement, scheme of arrangement applies to a company where the company can restructure without the interference of uh, interference of uh, outsider. So they can, they can just restructure with the sanction of court without interference of anyone from the outside. So judicial management means a judicial manager will take in charge of their company. So meaning that the existing board of directors will need to go if they are asked to by the judicial manager. This is what we borrow from Singapore. This has been around in Singapore for some time. And another thing is corporate voluntary arrangement. This is different from the scheme of arrangement in that under the corporate voluntary arrangement, they will have uh, someone called nominee who is going to um, put in the restructuring plan. So this is good for the company which do not know what to do. And for the first one scheme of arrangement is the company which actually would like to get out of the situation without interference of uh, an outsider. So I will go to this later, but this is the, I just like to highlight, there are some measures uh, aiming at the rehabilitating the companies. Okay. And as I mentioned here, purpose of insolvency law now has evolved and we are now about to take into account uh, mass layoff, uh, losing jobs, eh? harm to customers, suppliers, general improvement of communities and losses of confidence in commercial, financial banking and political system. Because sometimes a company may only may also carry its you know, activities and also the contribution to the strategic strategically to the society. So we are not supposed. Sometimes the company is too big to lose, because once the company is closing down, uh, many of the workers also closing down and many don't have any earning anymore. So that will cause social impacts and so on. So that is the consideration apart from, we will going to uh, so-called punish those companies because it becomes uncompetitive. There is a, some weakness in the managerial team. The company is simply lazy or uh, not innovative. They are not creative. They just allow the company to become unproductive. So this is the purpose of insolvency that I think over time we have been in place before the pandemic. And now we are like to see what happened after the pandemic. 
yeah, just because before that, I just like to let you through what is a rescue actually. Rescue is just to restore the company to its former health state or maybe partially. It's even partially is good enough. If possible, we like to make the company as it was before the, it, it is facing difficulties, but it is a major intervention to avoid failure of the company. And it could be formal or informal. What I just discussed just now is the formal one, which requires court intervention. The informal one, we can do it just by negotiation and so on, without actually the need of the court. But the downside is, you have no sanction by the court, it means that it can be subject to sabotage. Uh, the creditors may withdraw and so on. <clears throat> this is the end product of any restructuring measures. The company may be restructured, restored, or maybe pieces of the business will be subject to a sell off. Meaning that it has been probably some of their subsidiary can be still operating uh, or can be downsizing. The, the, probably the size is uh, now less than previously. Okay, so this alternative corporate rescue mechanism is the one that I explained already. Contain, this is the the one that I just explained to you, this is a repetition. Section 176 is actually part of the scheme of arrangement. CVA is corporate voluntary arrangement. GAM is judicial management. So this is it, the, the one we have now before the pandemic. So this is the, the you know, the route. Uh, Mr. Rahandi, what time I have actually? Uh, two minutes again, Prof. Actually, twenty minutes. Eh? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So I think I can give this quickly. This is the procedure. <clears throat> this is the procedure uh, for applicable to. This is judicial management. Just now, what we have is compromise or arrangement, and now we have CBA. So this is just a procedure in order to make them uh, applicable to the companies. But what I mean, I like to stress here, within the limited time frame, what I like to stress here is the time given, the moratorium, the suspension period is, for example, this one is six months. It's quite long, but at the same time, judicial management is quite, quite costly. It cannot apply to many of the companies. This one is CVA. It only applies 28 days plus 60, 60 more days, meaning that three months. We have been experiencing, we have been in the pandemic, maybe two years. So just imagine if the moratorium period is just three months, easily the company cannot, cannot survive. Huh? So that is the problem with the current system. So this is what I just show you for moratorium period. They are most likely less than uh, six months. So 90 days, 90 days, and almost three, six months. This is obsolete already. Eh? This is obsolete. What we have is here. Eh? So most of the, most of these actually measures are no longer uh, suitable, applicable to pandemic situations. Eh? So during the pandemic, what we introduced is this measure, there are multiple measures. Among the most important thing is to uh, impose this, what we call emergency power. <clears throat> we have been subject to emergency uh, until, until very recently it has been removed. So emergency power will not allow this kind of, you know, uh, will uh, for the economic life and the public order, they, they, they don't allow any more kind. This is very much political, I mean. Uh, I think I'm not going to detail about this. This is much political, just not to allow uh, the other part, the other block uh, to question about the prevailing government, government of the day. But you know, the Asian government has 
uh, changed their prime minister many times. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> this is the COVID-19 Act <clears throat> 2020, which was introduced. The most important one is this, the 50,000 threshold for the bankruptcy has been increased to 100,000. As a result, you cannot bring the case easily to the individual. <clears throat> There are so much more action um, uh, introduced in order to give suspension to the payment to allow debtor not to give to 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 allow debtor spaces their yeah, space eh, not to be brought under the uh, under 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 proceedings. And for the corporate borrowers, ten thousand to fifty thousand. If you notice, fifty thousand is less than one hundred thousand. One hundred thousand is for individual. Fifty thousand is for companies. Eh? So meaning that companies are treated less favorably, but it doesn't mean that it is not huge. Eh? Ten thousand to fifty thousand lib is very much uh, margin here, eh? and we can see from the number after this. Eh? So. That's why during the pandemic, what they can do is the government introduced some kind of uh, first blanket moratorium for six months and the targeted one after that. Eh? So blanket moratorium is given without actually any kind of those you know, uh, measures in place under law. This is purely a government measure just uh, out until 20, 30, 30, uh, this one year already. Eh? 30th of September 2020. And this has been given blanket. Blanket means applied to anybody, every company, everyone. So this one is when the first MCO, Movement Control Order was introduced. But the targeted one, and then because the bank cannot really observe, you know, uh, absorb the amount of non-payment here. So after that, those who can pay, uh, continue to pay, and those who cannot pay need to apply to the bank. So they have to therefore become targeted. Huh? So at the same time, there are so many economic stimulus packages. I am not going to deal with this in length. I just like to let you know, at this moment, the most important thing is for the suffering business, they need injection. Not just vaccine. Vaccine. They need. They. They. Not only the people need vaccination, but also the, the business also need some kind of help, uh, additional help from the government. So these are the kind of you know packages aim at them to let them to recover. So we have the various spaces for this purpose, and you know, eventually we hope that in the end we can see some kind of light in the tunnel, this is economic package relief. We are now call ourselves in the phase of pomulihan recovery, recovery uh, phase. Okay, so what I just like to stress here, uh, it's not enough for the government, it's not enough for the individual, it's not enough for the uh, laws in place, just to address this situation that we have now. We have really a bold policy in order to get them out, to put things right. And what you can see is the moratorium for six months, which has been blanketly given, and further moratorium, suspension of payment to the data uh, in the uh, uh, you know, uh, targeted, targeted among those who are not capable. So we could see the back one day partition from 2009 to 2020, 2021, April up until April here. The statistic that we have, you see from 2021 and 2020, we can see the marked difference here. Not because of there's less case. We know this is during the pandemic, but because of the, because of the threshold, because of the uh, moratorium. This is because of the government assistance. And similarly, this is the number of the uh, cases we have uh, with respect to the uh, <coughs> winding up petitions. And this one is for bankruptcy petition. Uh, 
it's very small here, but I just could show you, for example, in Selangor, uh, Wilayah Persekutuan is what we call Kuala Lumpur. From 2019, 2020 to 2021, so we have less number of cases. So because of the government intervention, because of the positivism among the governments. Eh? So hopefully with that is the way forward. But what we need now is to just be perseverance, become perseverance in order to, uh, to bring us forward. So hopefully one day we can just live the way what we enjoy last time eh? with uh, the real normal life, not in the new, no longer in the new normal. Eh? So, okay, uh, thank you very much. And of course, I welcome a uh, question from, from the audience. Thank you, thank you. I'm uh, back to, back to uh, Mr. Rahandi, okay. Uh, how to stop sharing. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very, very much, Professor Hassani. Uh, it is very insightful and useful uh, to enrich uh, our knowledge uh, regarding uh, bankruptcy uh, in Malaysia, especially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, it's very uh, useful and beneficial for us. Okay, uh, now we move to Q&A session. So, uh, dear all participants, if you have any question uh, against our honorable speaker, uh, please uh, you can uh, write down your uh, question in chat box or you can uh, use a uh, raise hand feature, then uh, unmute your speaker and open your cam to speak directly against our notable speaker. Uh, before I I'm focusing uh, on the chat box, uh, any, anybody want to raise hand and talk directly? To Professor Hassani. Hello. Anybody want uh, asking directly to Professor Hassani? Uh, okay. Here is any one. Uh, Muhammad Syukur. Uh, Syukur, uh, please uh, open your cam and unmute uh, your microphone in order you you are able to talk directly against uh, our notable speaker. Halo, syukur. Okay. Uh, hello, good morning, uh, Mr. Tahandi and Prof. Hasani. Uh, am I audible? Yes, 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 proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Hasani. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, Prof, my name is Muhammad Febrian Syukur, and uh, yeah. I would like to ask you a question. Uh, in this app, based on data from OECD.org, the bankruptcy rate in countries such as France, Germany, and Italy has decreased during part of 2020, or uh, as the COVID-19 crisis hit, because they suspend the obligation to file for, for bankruptcy. Is it possible uh, for Indonesia or Malaysia to implement this uh, regulation on this country. Thank you, uh, Prof. Hassani. Okay, thank you much, Shukur. Uh, Mr. Randi, are you going to uh, let all the uh, questions come in or I can uh, still answer the questions? Okay, uh, you can uh, respond to this answer first. The, uh, sorry, this okay. question first. Okay, all right, okay. Thank you, Muhammad Shukur. Uh, actually, yes, what happened all over the world? The suspension of payment to debts are actually given uh, quite uh, in a blanket form, even in US, French, Australia, uh, some, some of the advanced jurisdictions. Why that is so? Just because as what I mentioned, this economic situation is actually unwelcome. Uh, they, are, they are not our faults. Uh, no one actually predict uh, the pandemic will bring about the impact that what we are experiencing. So to let the business down unnecessarily is, is in fact will give the uh, domino effects. 
the further effect to the other uh, constituents, especially among the populations. So the, the workers cannot do job, they lose their strategic contribution to the economy and so on and so forth. So that's why we give we give just a blanket blanket moratorium. But I'm not sure Indonesia from but from what I see, there's no really a blanket moratorium. What I could see is based on the application. Application from one to another. So that, that's what if I'm not mistaken. Based on the application that they cannot pay, the 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 the, the bank may entertain their uh, classic um, their you know, applications. In Malaysia, it happened up until one year ago, 30th of September, last time, we have a blanket moratorium, even the individual who can pay, they can choose not to pay during that time. It's a blanket applied to everybody. It applies to everybody, regardless of whether you are T20, M40 or B40, you will be uh, relieved from paying your debts during the time frame. But afterwards, if the company is experiencing, only afterwards, if the company is still experiencing difficulty in paying the, their financial obligation, only then. So the impact is, as what you can see from the, you know, the statistic that I just show you, it really gives some kind of breathing space to the company not to be subject to the winding up proceedings. So because winding up proceedings at this time around, especially, are quite unproductive and very unsolicited. And they are not truly really, uh, welcome. This is the least effect of economy that we would like to see. Maybe that's part of uh, what I could respond to your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Hassani, very insightful. Okay, do you have a following question, Sukur, to Professor Hassani? Uh, no, Parahani, it's enough. Okay, thank you, Sukur. Uh, okay, Professor Hassani, uh, I will uh, give a little response about uh, blanket moratorium in Indonesia. Okay. So uh, this uh, this course uh, bring pro and cons uh -huh. in economic uh, expert. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, for pro pro side, uh, the reason is uh, this policy uh, already uh, applied in several country. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other side, but on the other side, uh, we know that uh, Indonesia is the, the one country who suffered a financial monetary crisis in 1998. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. yeah. This is about uh, moral hazard potential. Mm -hmm. Moral hazard potential. So uh, on the con side, uh, maybe Indonesian government... Uh, not ready to uh, apply or uphold uh, this policy nowadays because uh, we consider uh, about uh, the moral hazard potential that mm -hmm. can arise from this mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. So uh, why uh, Indonesian government uh, still uh, until now uh, not yet uh, apply this policy in our country? Uh, we just uh, wait and see first by uh, looking on another practices in another uh, at other country. Yes, Professor Rasani. <laughs> okay, thank you for your you know for your explanation regarding the Indonesian situation. Yeah, yeah. we are. Uh, I think we have to respect the policymakers, and I think Indonesia learns. A lot no, from what happened, especially in 1997, 1998, <laughs> they become more careful <laughs> in managing their economy. Uh, so maybe maybe that's the reason. But after all, the blanket moratorium now this most of the country already uh, removed that. Now the moratorium is still given, but the, the suspension is based on the merit, based on the case to case basis. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Hassani. Okay, okay now uh, 
before I uh, moving to chat box, maybe uh, any another participant uh, want to talking directly uh, to Professor Hasani. Any other participant want to open mic and asking directly? Okay, uh, now uh, because uh, nobody want to ask directly, now uh, we move to chat box question. Okay, all right. Uh, the first question coming from uh, Mr. Welly Yapin. Uh, he is uh, our international undergraduate student. Okay. Okay. Uh, the question is, good morning, Professor Hassani. Uh, morning. I would like to ask, in this pandemic situation, many companies are petitioned for bankruptcy. If the company wants to make a going concern effort to consider the continu continuity of the business, then what needs to be considered in this regard? Thank you, Professor. Okay, so uh, I must answer this from a Malaysian perspective that I know because <laughs> uh, I'm not really aware of what happened in Indonesia on this. But in Malaysia, for example, uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, rescue regime. So the rescue regime is in place eh, in order to, to avoid uh, action taken against them. Eh. But uh, let's say there is a, you know, even if we have a blanket moratorium, that blanket moratorium only applies to, uh, to the banks. Eh within the bank system. So the bank cannot take action against the company, but that does not prevent company from uh, subject to the actions by other claimants or other creditors. So what we have is, we have the rescue regime. The rescue regime actually, maybe uh, with the sanction of the court, that's why we can do it formally. We apply to the court in order to make sure that we are uh, given room for a negotiation. So, so what happened in the negotiation is we would like to ask, uh, to ask for the uh, sanction by the court in order to allow the company to propose a plan to get out of the situation. So that's what happened. And I just mentioned in Malaysia, there are three types of major rehabilitation measures. One is scheme of arrangement where the company doesn't need an outsider. They will out their plan on their own. Or we can have a judicial manager. Judicial manager will be actually proposed and appointed by the creditor. And also uh, CVA is uh, uh, the corporate voluntary arrangement. This one will require a participation by a insolvency practitioner. We call it uh, nomini. Nomini will put up a, a plan that we can work out no, for a uh, rescue uh, uh, regime or rescue procedure. So to get out the situation, that's what in Malaysia. So at least we have still have that kind of you know uh, uh, procedures in place eh, in order to protect the company from being wound up at the time when especially this time around when the, the economic become inactive because of the situation. And apart from this is apart from the fact that the threshold for bankruptcy or for the winding up the company has been heightened, has been uh, increased from, uh, you know, 30,000 to 50,000. So 50,000 ringgit is a very huge amount. So when it applies to an individual, it has been up to until 100,000 ringgit. Uh, I don't know how to calculate at the moment. Eh? Uh, it's been, uh, but 100,000 and 50,000 is quite therefore uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, more higher than higher than the previously imposed eh, the amount. That's what I could respond. So it depends on the court, uh, whether or not they are convinced, whether we can secure the, therefore the 
voting of the majority of the creditors eh, to agree with our plan. That's what I, I could say in Malaysia. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Hassani. Uh, uh, let me, uh, if you uh, oh, please, uh, so I want a uh, response a little uh, about uh, this business going concern in Indonesia. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, principal uh, business going concern in Indonesia, uh, which accommodated in the uh, in into law number thirty seven two thousand and four uh, regarding to insolvency and uh, suspension spend to payment uh, the principle of going concern uh, also attached uh, inside uh, this regulation uh, inside this regulation uh, uh, it's mean that uh, the state are uh, giving opportunity against debtor to do first restructure restructuring his debt uh, by uh, paying all of his debt or only a uh, part of his debt against uh, the creditor. So uh, uh, it wish to uh, the all obligation from debtor can be uh, running smoothly. Uh, and the debtor can uh, fulfill its obligation and uh, continue his business. So uh, yeah. It's it is uh, in Indonesian situation that mm -hmm. I can uh, describe in brief. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we are moved to the next uh, question from Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary also a uh, international undergraduate student uh, mm -hmm. here. Okay, uh, from Ros uh, Rosemary asking about what is the most appropriate appropriate form of a composition plan during this pandemic to convince creditors? Yeah, what is you. the most appropriate form? Yeah. Thank Please you, respond Rosemary. it, uh, Professor Ani. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Rosemary, for the questions. Um, yeah, it's not easy actually to convince creditors, especially if they are the one who have a uh, most stake in the, in the, uh, in the loan or uh, in the unpaid loan of the companies. But what the situation is, especially during the pandemic, when we know the company cannot move on and actually the business just cannot uh, operate the way how it operated uh, before the pandemic, it doesn't mean that this is a temporary situation. So if let's say we allow them to take the action, there is uh, many possibilities to, to, to this. Apart from the other stakeholders' concerns, we also probably may have a situation where even the creditor themselves cannot be paid in full. Why that is so? Because the possibility is most of the assets also probably facing the same problem of in terms of the valuation because most of the assets in the company are not, um, most of the collateral or the purpose of the this, uh, loan given not necessarily coming from the uh, solid asset of the company. They might come just for, because of their goodwill. It depends on the goodwill of the company. So because maybe the, the, their collateral is another share in the company. So they are so, so suffering losses. So in the end, if even if they stick to their plan to wind up the company, they still cannot earn or they can cannot still get back what they uh, expect because of the you know the, the domino effects of the uh, uh, price of the property at that time. So and most of the time, actually, uh, company don't have most of the company don't really have solid asset in order to back up their loans. So that also what happened. So even if the collateral, the collateral just does not enough to pay them. So what is the best way of? Let them restructure. Let them get out of the situation when the time comes. I think that is the, the best way out. Uh, I think that's one of the ways of how to convince uh, 
Uh, there could be many more ways. Uh. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Hasani. Okay, now uh, before I continue to read uh, the question from chat column, maybe uh, from the participant uh, want to asking directly to Professor Hasani. Okay, uh, the question from Miss Anggita Doramia Lomban Raja. She okay. is uh, our lecturer in Faculty of Law. Okay, okay. Uh, Miss Anggita. Okay, this platform is yours now. Thank you very much, well, Mr. Wazirato, Mr. Rohanti. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Uh, Professor Hassani. Nice yeah, pleasure afternoon. to meet you. <laughs> you. Okay, yeah. I want to ask uh, something regarding about digital innovations in uh, bankruptcy issues. So we right now know about uh, the development of the bankruptcy online uh, applications. Has Malaysia been applied these uh, applications uh, to uh, apply, uh, to uh, provide the people to apply the bankruptcy forms in the digital uh, facilitations. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Angita. So it's really a very interesting question. Thank you. Actually, I just have a seminar last two days about this <laughs> digital development in uh, insolvency and also in other areas. What, what I could say is the problem with the digital economy, uh, we cannot really at the moment fail to tap the full potential of the digital digitalization, especially regarding the commonality of data. So what happened, uh, I do not know what I, uh, why Malaysia still facing this kind of problem. In the other, in the other more advanced jurisdiction, for example, in UK, for example, they, and other EU countries, eh, European countries, they managed to uh, share data. Uh, they managed to share data without actually worrying that they may be manipulated or exploited. So they can actually benefit from the commonality of data, which uh, therefore they can provide a check and balance and so on with the other information. But in Malaysia, even between agencies, they are very slow. Uh, maybe even in the, between agencies, I'm, I'm talking about the government, administrative agencies, even they, they are quite slow in allowing their data because maybe in manpower, uh, in order to allow them, you expose the data to the, the third party, and that is, uh, you know, we are not probably strong enough in order to prevent such kind of abuses of data. I, I do not know, uh, and also we are we do not know how to how to restructure them. That is another possibility. So, but yes, uh, I would say in Malaysia what we call SSM, Malaysian companies. Uh, commission, the one which uh, actually regulate the uh, companies in Malaysia, they have this kind of electronic filing and so on. It's already in place, but not to the extent that they are 100% that they are, uh, uh, the possibility is they, they, there are many still rooms for improvement about for what I can say. I do not know what happened in this year. Actually, uh, so Malaysia have tried this uh, uh, these applications to provide. Actually, during this pandemic, yeah. we have to have uh, remotely access. So this uh, such uh, applications is very useful for the uh, users of the applications. Yeah, Thank you very much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Many of the situation is the question about the validity. Uh, how are we going to verify <laughs> the validity of the information? So that is uh, you know, the challenge. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor for yeah, the answer okay. questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Miss Angita. Uh, do you have any further question, maybe, or it is no, enough? Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, anybody want to raise hand again? 
and asking directly to Prof. Asani. Uh, okay, uh, we are back to chat column, yeah. Uh, the next, the next question come to uh, come from uh, Sela Amelia. Uh, hello, Prof. Asani. Was the bankruptcy that occurred during the pandemic really caused by the pandemic, or was it because the company balance sheet already had problems? So uh, I think uh, she means that uh, the pandemic only the reason to dodge the obligation from the company. Mm. Okay, please, Professor Hassani, uh, the platform is yours to answer. Okay. Thank you. This is another very interesting question. I, actually, I really like this question. Uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, for corporate governance, uh, I'm talking about corporate governance now. If let's say a corporate governance is in place for most of the company, they should have that kind of measure to predict the risk, to anticipate risks. Among them is the risk of possible pandemic may cause their business trouble or problems in years to come. And the ways of how to get out of this. Corporate governance is just not to check whether you are uh, there is a mismanagement or there is a creative accounting take, taking place within the company. That, that is not all. But also the good governance is to make sure the company is prepared. So how to make sure the company is prepared? Yeah, just among other things is to digitalize the company. Um, you know, for most of the company, when this situation, when they face this kind of, you know, difficulty situation, they, they know just how to route, reroute their activities. For example, if they know they cannot sell it based on their premise, whatever product that they have, they may go online. Maybe they can find buyers there they can stay afloat and they can survive. That is another way how they can survive. For example, so they have many, many strategies just to get out of the situation, unless they are, for example, tourism. But for example, it happened to one of the airline companies in Malaysia. Uh, what they are doing is they cannot, one of the ways how they do, 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 uh, deal with the situation is by offering their catering business instead. Because they cannot fly, at least they can let the catering department of their, the catering unit of their business still operate eh, to continue. So that is among the strategies. So when the question is about whether it is the pandemic really caused the, pan, uh, the business become problematic, probably Yes, but to, to a certain extent, but most likely they have this kind of vigilant ears and eyes to predict and to monitor the situation before it becomes worse. Uh, so there, there must be some kind of in place eh, in order to, to avoid damages to the company before they can actually collapse. But only certain, certain companies sometimes some companies just cannot have that kind of opportunity. Uh, that, that. So yeah, the, this requires therefore a due diligence and the duty of care on the part of the operators of the business. Eh? Or whether or not they have put in place all this measure to avoid eventual disaster. <laughs> uh, I would say <laughs> that, that's my opinion. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Asani, for your elaboration. Okay. Uh, we are continue uh, on the next question uh, from Elisa Julie. Uh, Prof. Asani, I would like to ask if there is, is a Malaysian government policy that regulates debt relief for debtors to meet their obligation during this COVID-19 situation, where we know that many companies have gone bankrupt and cannot fulfill their obligation to pay their debts. Thank you, Professor. Okay. As I mentioned, when there is a blanket moratorium imposed up until 30th of September and has been actually 
uh, extended in a more targeted form. It means that uh, from the policymaker, they already actually put uh, in place some kind of measure in order to reduce the burden on the part of the debtors company if they cannot pay their obligation. Uh, so if let's say they still cannot pay and they would like to minimize the possibility the companies become or subject to winding up proceeding, what they can do is to therefore either to start negotiation, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are two types of rescue regime. One is informal, one is uh, formal. The formal one is the rescue regime that we have the sanction of the courts, as I uh, mentioned. It could be a scheme of arrangement, it could be judicial management, it could be corporate voluntary arrangement. But on the other hand, we also have this kind of informal negotiation. So we can start with the informal negotiation. And after all, especially if the companies between the, the, the debtors and the creditors, if their uh, relationship is such, uh, they depend on each other. For example, they, they are in the supplier and uh, the other company is the buyers. So they depend on each other. So the best way out is to, to, to negotiate eh, about prob probably they need some space eh, in order to get out of this, the situation for, for, for a while. Eh? And even worse, we also don't like much, much more, uh, what we call, uh, lay, mass, mass layoff eh, among the workers. Eh? Even though that is something unavoidable, I know from the economic situation, there are many become jobless as a result. But we can try to minimize as far as possible the impact before it getting from worse to uh, bad to worse and worse to even worse. <laughs> okay, uh, that's what I could respond to that question. Okay, thank you, Professor Hassani, uh, for your answer. Okay, uh, the next question uh, uh, come to Putri Tiana and Wildan Mahendra. Actually, uh, both of them have a correlation question, so I will resume it to brought to you to bring to you. Okay, uh, okay, Professor Hassani. Uh, we know that uh, several lender have used. Uh, this pandemic condition to make company bankrupt. Even though the company is still able to carry out business acts regarding the present of bankruptcy moratorium and suspension payment, why, they, why, why do you think this policy needs to be implemented by law in Indonesia uh, according the success story in Malaysia? And then what's the impact of the moratorium? And the third is, uh, uh, what consideration of Malaysian government did before implementing, implementing the stimulus blanket economic package? There's any three question, uh, Professor Hassani, who has same correlation. Okay. Uh, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Randy. So the question is about uh, given by Putri Tiana. Okay. Uh, yeah. We don't know. And will then, yeah. Oh, will then. Okay. Uh, whether or not Indonesia will also impose a moratorium. I think a blanket moratorium that Malaysia imposes during the beginning. Uh, actually, Malaysia just follow the example from maybe US and EU countries eh, where they actually introduce this kind of blanket moratorium. So Malaysia just follow suit. So that probably become best practice then. But now I think no, no more blanket moratorium applicable to any economies just because why? 
Just because nowadays, since especially the vaccination phases, uh, most of the situation getting better. They now call it pandemic to endemic. Eh? They, they, they just think that this is no big deal. The virus is just something that we can deal with. We can know how to manage the, the, the virus. Eh? Uh, if we, even if it is uh, it's still contaminated, but it can be uncontrolled. So because of that, it's the, the situation, the economy will be back that uh, soon. So you we have that Euro 2020, for example, is still taking place despite the pandemic. <laughs> so that, that is kind of situation now, probably in the year to come, maybe next year, most of the economy will start open up. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we don't need that kind of blanket moratorium. But still, some companies are still suffering, especially if the companies are uh, restaurants or the companies are uh, tourism industries, airline companies. These are the companies probably may take time to recover compared to the other company. Some are company making a huge fortune during this, especially pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies, or just like Malaysia when they are selling glove. Uh, uh, you know, rubber glove. <laughs> yeah, they, they are they are making fortune. So because of the pandemic. So, uh, and the next question is, uh, what are the main consideration for the uh, Malaysia government? Uh, the stimulus package. The stimulus package is aimed at preventing the company from, uh, not only to preventing company from being closed down unnecessarily, but the most important thing is to re uh, reignite, to allow the business to operate. And in order to do that is first and foremost, those most affected population must be given the buying power. Uh, so the buying power may be given from them, just give them money. Give them money in order to not not to let them starve, uh, suffering from the starvation. Not not to let them hunger, but also at the same time they will stimulate the economy. So when the activity, the economy, economy activities is taking place, so most likely the uh, the other domino effect is to the other business also start picking up. Uh, so. Uh, that's why uh, they are aimed at the most affected segment of the economy, especially the small micro businesses, uh, the, you know, this B40 and the affected M40 and the business which are affected directly by the by the pandemic. That's what I could okay. Like say. <laughs> okay, thank you, Prof. Asani. Uh, there is in uh, chat column any two last question uh, for Professor Hasani. Okay, uh, the first one is coming come from uh, Miss Fanya, the Miss Fanya Putri Davanti. Uh, good morning, Professor Hasani. I would like to ask: Are there any significant difference in bankruptcy in Malaysia before and during the COVID nineteen pandemics? The comparative uh, professor, Comparat comparison situation uh, about bankruptcy in Malaysia before and post pandemic. Okay, please, yeah. Professor Hassani. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you, Fania, for the question. Actually, that's what happened. Uh, because of the threshold of the bankruptcy has been increased, uh, both for the individual and the company. So, we could see, therefore, the bankrupt situations from the statistic that I just show you, it seems that there are less in number. Uh, there are less in number because, because of the uh, creditors cannot take or initiate petition against them. They cannot take action against those companies. That is why the reason why these companies cannot cannot be subject to winding up proceeding, why this individual cannot be subject to the bankruptcy proceeding. But uh, the, the truth is uh, the pandemic has brought a situation where they become worse. 
financially. So just because they cannot reach the threshold, <laughs> uh, that that's for sure. So uh, it seems from the statistic, it looks nice eh? uh, because the number is getting lower. <laughs> okay, that's what I could respond to that question. So. Okay, thank you for your response, Professor Hasani. Response, Professor Hasani. Okay, uh, this is uh, the last question uh, from Raisa Sandra. Uh, professor, I would like to ask you a question. We know that uh, just like Malaysia, Indonesia is currently also conducting a national economic recovery. One of which is also by providing a stimulus to SMEs. Do you think uh, providing, do you think providing stimulus do you think providing stimulus uh, for uh, SME is an effective rescue for the SME? Since it is only a temporary fix to the current situation due to the government policy that going back and forth in reopening the economy. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Uh, I, I think I got two two issues here. Yeah. yeah. One, whether or not the, the stimulus will uh, actually save the company. Yeah. Okay. Because this is, after all, a, a temporary situation. But we also know that the stimulus package is also temporary in nature. So temporary problem with the temporary. Uh, rectification. Eh? Uh, so I think that's fair. <laughs> it means that how are we going to deal with this is providing a temporary measure for them a uh, breathing space. So at least they can, for the moment, operate without uh, actually thinking about uh, uh, their cash flow. Eh? So for the, for the while, they can actually relieve their cash flow. Eh? But uh, the government keep on you know, imposing, yes, that's what happened in Indonesia, that's what happened in Indonesia. Sometimes less restrictive, sometimes more restriction. So <laughs> they, they, they keep on, you know, uh, they, are, they are not actually static. Eh? They are uh, keep on uh, uh, changing eh, from time to time. So I would say uh, the stimulus package, once the uh, this is given, it's not for maybe for a period of one month, two months, three months. It may take time. So, so far what also what we are experiencing, is the economy, since ever the stimulus package is released, maybe it's no, not, not more than one year maybe. It's very recent. Only, only very recently the government, especially in Malaysia, the government is very, uh, active in giving uh, pa uh, packages to the to the needy, eh? so I would say, given the optimism that we are actually have now, those probably hopefully they can still uh, have the opportunity, the chances to work out and to get out the situation. Uh, I think there's much. Active, uh, positivism over this compared to last time. So, uh, mainly because of the vaccination program uh, in Malaysia, especially. Yeah? Uh, it's not because the situation become less, uh, you know, the, this, this situation become better, no. Uh, but because of the, the vaccination, and people believe and more confident that we will eventually get back to the normal life. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there any others, professor? Maybe in response to this question. Uh, hello, professor Asani. Yes. Uh, uh, maybe uh, any others? Uh, any others uh, to respond uh, the last question? What What question is it? Oh uh, no no. Uh, the previous question, any additional statement maybe from you or oh, that, that's all? I think that's, that, that's all I could offer. <laughs> so. 
Okay, thank you very much, Professor Hasani. Uh, now we are going to the end of session. Uh, before uh, I close uh, this virtual class, uh, perhaps you have a closing statement uh, regarding uh, our discussion for today. Okay. What I would like to say is uh, this pandemic is something which not within our control and we never know the extent of which it may affect our economy and our life. This only, you know, uh, the economy at the same time affects the life of many. So because of it really become a concern to the business especially. So I think the law, first and foremost, the law in place should be supportive. And the policymaker should also be supportive to the business in the way that we must find way out that give us win-win situation for all. So because nobody actually would like to suffer more than what they should, uh, especially if this is not nothing to do with their faults. Uh, yeah, it is maybe because our fault no, for not observing our SOP, <laughs> allowing the pen. But at the same time, we can, if let's say everything is in place, it is no longer our fault. And so we should strive and we must give room. And therefore the attitude of the law should be uh, supportive, should be uh, very uh, rehabilitative in order to allow the business to survive. And also the, the government, also the policymaker also does have played their role. In many countries, they also offer some kind of positive intervention in order to not to allow the situation to become worse. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that's what I could uh, sum up. And also, thank you very much for Undeep. And also the question, I think most of the questions are very interesting. It shows that uh, you followed what I'm trying to share with you. I'm very pleased. <laughs> and thank you also for the Undi uh, to, uh, to have me this morning. To, thank you for your attendance. <laughs> and thank you for Mr. Rahandi for chair, uh, moderating the session. And also to Ibu Tri Aksmi. <laughs> uh, and also all the management of the Undi uh, for having me this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Hasani, uh, for a uh, uh, virtual class today. Uh, it was a marvelous and outstanding uh, session. Uh, on behalf of uh, our faculty leaders and all of the committee, uh, I would like to gratitude for your attendance today. Yeah. Okay, uh, I hope uh, this is not our last meeting, uh, and we wish that you can join on another uh, collaboration with uh, Faculty of Law, the Ponegoro University. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, I, I I want to thank you also uh, to Bilsa uh, for the information, Professor Ani. Uh, Bilsa is a student organization uh, who has uh, or concern in uh, business law mm. study. Okay. Okay. Uh, in in our faculty. Thank you for Bilsa for your support uh, in this occasion. Okay, uh, before I return back uh, this platform to Maharani, uh, I would like to apologize uh, if uh, in this discussion, uh, I did uh, many lots uh, mistaken and errors. Keep safe and stay healthy during the pandemic. Uh, see you on another series of visiting lecturer. Maharani, uh, I will give uh, this platform to you. Thank you, Mr. Rahadi Rizky Prananda for guiding us throughout the discussion session. And also, we would like to say thank you to our speaker, Professor Dr. Hassani Muhammad Ali, for a very insightful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at our last agenda of visiting lecture sessions. So please, I would welcome all the participants to turn on the camera and be ready for the photo session.
everyone may turn on the camera uh, because we will begin the photo session in a few seconds. All right, we're still, we are still waiting for the other participants to turn on the camera. All right, the photo will be taken by me and we'll begin from the first slide. Three, two, one, smile. And the next slide. Three, two, one, smile. And the last slide. Three, two, one, smile. Okay, thank you so much everyone for turning the camera on and participating in the photo session. And thank you very much to all guests and participants for attending to the visiting lecture. Thank you for the active participation and also the attention during the session. It has been a wonderful morning with all of you. See you on the next visiting lecture series held by Faculty of Law, Universitas Diponegoro. Good morning. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Hassan.